Thank you all for coming. Stephanie Clark of White and Burke. I'm a consultant hired by the city to help lead this master planning process. I'm joined today with Mike Vitti from Black River Design, the architect uh, hired by our team, and Dave Saladino, who you can see up there on the screen, is from VHB, who has helped us with a number of the natural resources and traffic assessment. I'll get into that in a little bit. And we also have Kelly Murphy here on the city team, the assistant city manager. And I think that's all our city team. Oh, Arnie is in the back from recreation. So that's the team. Tonight, we are going to run through a variety of different pieces of the presentation because I'm doing this hybrid and this is a little unfamiliar. I'm just going to be going back and forth to, to advance my slides, but. I don't have that many slides, so I won't be doing that a ton. But essentially tonight, what we're gonna talk about is I'm gonna review the process that we've been through. I'm gonna go over the due diligence that we have been working on for the last six, um, yeah, six months or so, um, as well as review all the community conversations we had in the fall and talk about the buildable areas. What we're here to talk about tonight is really the site and the structure of um, the, the process that we're doing around getting getting direction, not making decisions at this point around the buildable areas and the uses on the site. The buildable areas show opportunities and constraints. We have maps. There are map uh, copies, small copies available here in person for everybody. Um, they're also online for the online participants. We put a link in the chat that is uh, to the city website where all the buildable uh, area and test sketches are. Also here in person, we have a copy of a memo that we sent to city council that recapped a lot of what we're gonna be talking about tonight, but also re another memo that recaps all the public feedback from the last almost year now. We're gonna go through the test sketches. We're gonna talk a little bit, tiny bit about cost magnitude, and then we're gonna open it up for questions after the presentation. But from the, pres from the questions, we're gonna break out into activity and we're going to do an activity here in the room we're going to do an activity online two different activities with the same end goal and we're going to finish up with what we're calling a minute at the mic with whatever time we have remaining we're going to uh, have people be able to come up to the microphone and uh, on zoom speak whatever's on your mind and we'll be collecting all that feedback and you'll see where that process is going so we'll go to the next So this is phase one of the master planning process. A master planning process takes a really long time because this is a really important site. It's also a, a large in site. Progress. And so we this started last spring when the city acquired the property. Then the city hired our consultant team in early fall to help with the due diligence and the master planning. We held community conversations over the fall. We had concurrently a bunch of natural resources assessments, archeological assessments done on the property. And now it brings us to the winter phase, winter stage of this phase. And the winter stage is really an opportunities and constraints assessment period, which means it's giving us more, more opportunity for feedback because now we have known at qualities of the site for the community to respond to. And what we're looking for out of this stage is direction on the whole wide range of uses and the whole wide range of, of possibilities and start to narrow that a bit. Come the spring, we are going to have concept planning where we're gonna have more specific concepts for folks to respond to and really narrow down even further and then present that to city council ultimately makes the decision and city council will have all of this data from the year of, or nine months worth of community input, community conversations and um, including the survey that we're putting out right now, which I'll talk about, but putting all that together to then make a, rec make a recommendation, they will decide on the actionable master plan. So keep in mind, the actionable master plan is not your final land plan, but rather has action steps for recommendations for, your, for the city's next steps to take things further. You know, you can't do all your due diligence one time and be done, it's iterative. See if I got all my notes. Here we go. So this does take time, and we're we're in an interesting tension between the pressing nature of these needs, 
we know there's a housing crisis. We know there are recreation gaps and needs in this community. And there's funding available now that may not be available in a year, two years, four years. So we have that, that we have to balance with the integrity of the process. We heard loud and clear from our fall communications and conversations that a transparent and um, iterative and inclusive process were really important. So during this phase, this stage of the phase, During this stage, we are hosting a series of public meetings. We are uh, collecting data from a survey. We've, we've been publishing, publicizing this survey that we prepared far as far and wide as we could through a variety of different sources for folks to take the survey. I include everybody here, encourage everybody here to take the survey and tell your friends. I'm telling everybody here at this meeting to do all of these things or to encourage anyone you know to do these things. There's a five minute video online on YouTube that will help um, educate someone who wasn't maybe able to attend the meetings. So lots of different ways we've been flyering, lots of ways to get the word out. And so we, help, we encourage your, your participation and appreciate if you can help us spread the word. So in the fall, we held a variety of meetings. We had small stakeholder meetings. We did interviews. We did a survey of the uh, business community, a survey of high school students. And we gained a lot of information, a lot of intel that um, has helped us get to at least this part of the So this is a very uh, high level um, recap, you know, word cloud of what, what we heard, but the, the trends were very clear. Housing, recreation, and environmental sensitivity were top of the list for priorities. Transportation and access were the top planning concerns that we heard. And procedural process concerns, again, to be inclusive, to be transparent, and to be as, as iterative and engaged as we could. So that's what led us to this point today. So I'm going to turn to Dave Saladino, who's online, um, to talk through the, the due diligence and the site findings. There is a map on the screen. I'm aware it's a little, I don't know if we want to kill the front lights for folks in the room. Again, there are copies over here if you need a hard copy, but um, he'll walk us through the base map, the natural resources, existing conditions. And um, these are all online, so you have an opportunity to go on afterwards, and we also have them posted in the back. So when we do our exercise and get up, you'll be able to go out and see. So with that, Dave. Okay, great. Thank you, and um, welcome, everyone. Thank you all for uh, taking the time on this uh, chilly evening here. Um, uh, Stephanie, if you, um, oh, all right. Can you see my, you can see my mouse now? Okay, good. So, um, so what we're looking at here, albeit small, is um, uh, kind of a existing conditions map showing uh, natural resources on the 138, 133 acre site. Uh, this yellow border around the outside, and this will show up. This the same view will show up in the next few slides. So, just to orient you, the the uh, the yellow boundary here is the uh, the, the parcel uh, outline. So, 133.7 acres here. Um, down here, this little stem down towards the bottom is the access drive out to that's that's Country Club Road accessing Route Two. So this is the primary access into the parcel. Uh, the existing uh, building is here. Uh, you can see just under the yellow. I'm um, just to orient you, and then the Country Club itself, or the golf course, kind of extends out out in this area. So um, as many of you are are familiar with this this property, it is um, it's kind of set in a bit of a bowl. Uh, so we've got fairly steep uh, steep slopes both on the north and the south side. But um, as the, the, the golf course took advantage of this kind of ter terrace here, this, this flat area, so we've got some, some nice uh, kind of flat uh, land where the, uh, the country club was. Um, now, what we're looking at on the map itself, we've got um, kind of running north-south, we've got several um, stream channels and um, the buffers, those are buffered, those are um, kind of stream channels um, that uh, there's some protections within those buffers. Uh, so you can see those all running down towards the Minooski River. Um, what's shown in green here are the um, delineated wetlands. So we do have some wet areas, uh, particularly kind of primarily along those river, river corridors. Um, and then these yellow, you can see the yellow swabs off to the left, kind of one here in the middle and then this bright yellow. 
those are all identified as um, prime ag lands, um, two different designations, but they're prime ag. Uh, the soils here have been classified based on the, um, the, the county, the NRCS mapping. Uh, so we do see that a lot, a lot of the area is covered in this uh, kind of prime ag soil land. Um, and uh, uh, I guess just one final note, just on kind of the overall uh, kind of terrain here, both the, the west and the east sides are, um, are, are very challenging for any, any building. So uh, this kind of western side is very raviney. Uh, we've got some pretty steep slopes and drops. Uh, and similarly, on the right-hand side, it's a very steep drop off uh, with these channels. So as we get into the next slide here, we'll look, start to look at the build, buildable areas, and you'll see we're not really looking too much at these um, kind of external, the, the eastern, eastern, western corridors, but primarily focused on the kind of the uh, the more level terrain. Thanks, thanks, Dave. I'm going to hop in while we're still on site findings and due diligence. Um, there were three other assessments done beyond the natural resources during this phase, during this stage, and traffic was one of them. Although, Dave, I'm sure you'll talk about that actually. Um, and the um, archaeological resources assessment was conducted. There were a few sensitive sites identified, but mostly within the wetland areas or the wooded areas that won't be affected by development. Most likely they're not located within our buildable areas. But if they if there was development to be proposed and it, that would impact those areas, we would be doing further analysis so that we have pinned if we need to come back to it, but it seems unlikely given where they are located that they could remain undisrupted. Mm -hmm. um, it's, I'm just project, there's no, this isn't volume for here. This is volume for the computer. So I can speak louder though, I can try. Um, and we also had an existing buildings assessment done uh, by Black River Design to assess the condition of the Elks Club building that's there on site. And it was deemed in good condition. There are some limiting factors about the building itself, inherent factors that make it less desirable to expand for any use, specifically recreational uses, for example, um, like high ceilings wouldn't be possible in certain areas. And maybe the low window to floor area ratio would prohibit certain uses to break up the space, but it's in good condition. And so that may be a factor in how we want to see the building repurposed and used for any number of these different scenarios. So Dave, if you want to touch on traffic and then we can go on to buildable areas. Sure, yeah. So we did look at um, kind of an, as an initial pass, um, uh, kind of the traffic conditions. And so right now the site is not really generating much traffic. And so um, uh, at, at present time, the traffic issues are, 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 are not really present. Um, one of the things we did look at, so for this main access point, um, kind of a kind of a threshold question is at what point, uh, what level of development would trigger the need for a traffic signal at the entrance? Um, that's you know that is kind of a threshold thing at which you know there's there's costs associated with the signal, and you know obviously that would um, have some disruption to the flow on Route Two. So we wanted to kind of take a look at what level of development would um, get, get us close to the need for a traffic signal. And um, kind of based on that uh, preliminary analysis, we're looking at about 300 housing units. Um, so we were focused on residential. So anything in the 300 plus range of, of housing units probably puts us into a place where we're looking at a traffic signal. Anything below that or any mix of things that generates less than you know what 300 houses would generate, we're probably fine as is. Right now there's, uh, uh, for those of you who are familiar, Route 2 has a middle left turn lane out here right in front of Country Club Road. Uh, so there's one lane in each direction, and then you've got that center kind of um, also known as a suicide lane. And so that could be repurposed as a left turn lane into, into Country Club Road without significant expense. It's really a striping exercise. So really anything up to that point, we've got the capacity at the intersection to accommodate those trips um, as an existing just to stop control on Country Club Road. Um, we also looked at, and I think this is, um, has been noted previously, but the um, accessibility for transit service. Um, the closest stop is over half a mile away. And um, right now, there's not very good pedestrian accessibility to that to that transit stop, so that's certainly something that we want to be including into the um, the assessment. So we've got full accessibility to any of the uses that are are here at the site. Okay, so then, um, so going from the kind of existing conditions to this uh, kind of blob map, as as we uh, refer to. Um, this shows some uh, kind of designated buildable areas, and, and um, apologize for the uh, the small scale here, uh, but you can see here. So we've got um, kind of starting from the entrance coming up from Country Club Road, we've got this this kind of first blob here, which is the existing developed area where we've got the building and some parking. Um, so that's kind of that first area. 
Um, I'm gonna. Uh, I'll note here just in um, later on in this evening, we're gonna be. Um, we'll be uh, in asking you some questions about the types of uses that you'd like to see in each of these buildable areas. Um, we'll come back to this map at that point, but just um, to know uh, there will be an ask of you at at um, uh, at a future point to start thinking about you know within each of these different colored blobs what types of uses um, would be your your preference within each of those in each of those blobs. Um, so anyway, so so we've got the existing building here. This is the purple, uh, and then we come in. This red is probably the most uh, easily developable developable uh, piece of property. Dave, uh, both if you click your mouse, um, I, your mouse isn't moving, so you might oh. click. Oh, there you go. Yeah. There we go. Yeah. Thank you, Seth. Uh, so this red uh, area here is kind of the uh, the most um, I guess uh, readily developed area. It is. It's flat. It's adjacent to the existing developed area, um, easily access accessed from Route Two, uh, and is relatively flat. Um, and then we move on to some of these other areas that have uh, slightly uh, more moderate or steeper slopes. Um, uh, but then, as as noted here, as you can see, some of these have um, some, some. There's really like good... 57 people on here, so. Oh. Oh. So we've got. Um, We've got uh, different characteristics within each of these. Uh, many of these to the south and the west. Um, and uh, but but obviously getting back to some of these buildable areas further back um, are a little bit more uh, a little bit more challenging. It, it involves more infrastructure to get back from this access point on Route Two back. And so we'll we'll get into that. Uh, you'll see in the next couple of slides. So we've, we've essentially, um, you know, so A through F here in terms of buildable areas. Um, and uh, so just keep that in mind as we're going forward and we'll be looking um, for your thoughts on kind of the, the types of uses. Uh, the next three slides will show some um, test layout sketches here as, as shown here. And, and uh, kind of going back to what Stephanie had mentioned early on, what, what, what these sketches show are really kind of, we're trying to bookend the possible range of options. These are not by any means intended to be the answer. Um, what we tried to do is kind of at one end of the spectrum, look at kind of uh, the maximum housing perspective, you know, how much, what would this look like if we fit um, reasonably as many homes as we I could? Don't, here? I really don't know who's speaking right now. Can you, uh, can you, can you hear me? I'm not sure if we can. Can you can you hear me, Stephanie? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, we can okay. hear you. We just um, we're just turning up the volume a little bit here in the room, but um, we're asking all the other participants to mute during this section while we listen to your presentation, and then we'll open it up. Okay. Great. Oh, okay. That might help, Dave. Um, request to just slow down speaking just a little bit, just because of the audio here in the room. Thank you. Yes, I've I've been known to talk fast, so thank you. Um, so yeah, so these next three slides, so they are bookending. So we've got a maximum housing, we've got a maximum recreation, and then in between kind of a, um, you know, an intermediate um, option. And again, these are really just test sketches to kind of see how things lay out on the site. So we'll go through those and then we'll get into kind of, you know, how do those resonate with you? How do the, you know, the layout of the different uses um, on the site, how, how do those, um, you know, align with your vision? Oh, for listen to this. I'm going to have ice cream sandwiches. Do you want some? Some, so you mind, you I want yourself? to mention um, I want to mention that these are not exhaustive sketches. So when we had our conversations in the fall, we heard a lot of suggestions, a lot of options and possibilities for the uses. Those are not all represented here by any means. This is going this is testing scale and massing of the two most land intensive uses. Uh, recreation and housing. So things like solar arrays and maintaining wildlife corridors, very important, will absolutely be incorporated if if the community, there's you know pieces of how to get engaged and to promote those things. But when that gets accommodated would be in the concept phase, not in this stage. So just didn't want anyone to say we didn't pay attention to all that we just focused on these two. This is really, again, just trying to do a scaling and a direction for this stage. All right, Dave, you're up. 
Um, did you advance the slide, Seth? I'm still seeing test layout sketch. Oh, there we go. Okay. So uh, this is the first one you can see down at the bottom. This one is the maximum housing test. Um, and so again, the orientation is the same. So we're down here in this corner. This is route two, and this is the access point off of Country Club Road. You can see the existing Elks Club building here in white. And so just kind of driving through this, this test sketch here, as you come in from the, the south, uh, we've got the existing building here um, ringed around a community green. Sorry, Dave, you have to click oh. your button again. I clicked oh. the button, so it... Got Sorry, it. There you go. Thank you. Yep. Thanks, Steph. Uh, okay, so as we're coming in, um, we've got the existing Elks Club building here to orient you. Um, and then we've got a new community green with these uh, five-story uh, multifamily units. And again, this is, we chose five-story to kind of step back. You'll see kind of stepping back density. But this is all, um, uh, nothing here is set in stone. We're just, uh, again, testing this. But the idea here was to have kind of the highest density, again, in this maximum housing scenario around a community green and this existing building, which could be repurposed for, you know, uh, various uses. And then and then heading back, you can see kind of a loop road, an initial loop road here. So these, the number twos here, this kind of um, salmon colored are the three-story uh, multifamily units. Uh, these orange ones back here are triplexes or townhomes. Uh, you can see a, an array of those. And so we've got um, 138 units shown here, um, uh, 232 units here in the dark red, and then 108 units here in the in the salmon. Uh, and then all the way back, if you follow the roadway all the way back, we then have, um, we're showing 30, uh, 55 single family housing units all the way back um, uh, uh, with, you know, individual lots shown as as, as shown here. Um, one thing I also want to mention on each of these test sketches, we do show the U32 uh, uh, trail here, kind of running along the northern property boundary, and you know want to make sure that that is integrated into all of these kind of planning um, sketches as we move forward. So that's you know that's a potential layout if we wanted to maximize housing in the kind of the level terrace area of the property. Um, this test B is the other end of the spectrum. If, if the spectrum goes from you know, no housing to uh, 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 no recreation to full recreation. So this is the other end of the spectrum, maximum recreational uses. Uh, so again, coming in from the south here, uh, we've got some, uh, you can see in the gray is the parking. We've got the existing Elks Club building. Um, here we introduced two new buildings here where one is a community center and one is a, is a rec center, a recreational building. Um, it can be, uh, you know, purpose with lots of uh, various uses, pool, indoor tennis, and so forth. Um, the uh, uh, the, the pro programming is um, obviously a separate discussion, but those those buildings seem to um, fall logically kind of here along around the entrance. Um, and then those are, are um, kind of connected to these um, uh, suite of uh, athletic uh, fields. And so different size and different uh, uses here are shown. Um, you can see kind of pull-offs with parking areas here. Um, but the the extent of the kind of program space is much smaller than in the maximum housing. Uh, as you can see, you know the, the 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 roadway access only goes about a third of the way back. Uh, the remainder of the site is left open for you know um, kind of less program sites, whether it's trails or this could present some possibilities for some you know energy uh, you know um, uh, renewable energy, some solar solar facilities, some um, Abenaki heritage um, uh, 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 features. So this this does kind of uh, preserve a little bit more of the space, but really concentrates the recreational uses uh, closer to the existing Elks Club building. And then the, uh, this is um, was an attempt to kind of balance between the two, so between the two bookends. Uh, so in in this case, we're coming up from of, uh, up from uh, Route Two here. We've got the existing Elks Club building. This does retain both the community center and a recreational building. Um, a few rec uh, uh, site uh, uh, recreational fields, uh, as shown here, this does bring back the community green concept that's ringed by some multifamily dwellings here. This is showing uh, 70 units. If it's if these are three story, if they were to be built to be five story, it'd be about 140 units uh, in this location. Um, nothing co comes into this kind of buildable area here. We just have the single access drive back uh, just to um, 90 units of uh, townhomes and triplex units here and then uh, 13 single family housing units here at the end of the, of the access road. Thanks, Dave. Uh, we'll have time for questions for him in our next section after the presentation, but Mike Vitti is going to speak to these next few slides. Hi, Mike. So the first slide, the slide we're looking at now is just a 
Yeah, sorry. So the slide we're looking at now is generically showing the view corridors from this site. Uh, the northern end of the site, the uphill side, there's a lot of great views to the south, a lot of great exposure. Um, that's represented in the blue highlight there. So uh, from almost half, half the distance of the back hill, you get great views to the south. As you start to tuck out to the west area there, you start to be able to look further back to the east and you still get to see rolling hills, uh, lots of great daylight. Uh, the, the, one of the important things to notice is the yellow corridor there are the views to Camel's Hump, which really don't come into view until you're near the top of the hill. Um, half, two thirds of the way up the hill and uh, halfway along the back stretch is where you really get a chance to see the, the view of the Camel's Hump State Park. The next two slides you'll see here represent site sections through the entire, through the entire site. Uh, what we tried to do was show scale of different size buildings and bring the human scale into it. Uh, please note that these forms are just representative, trying to show different size buildings, three-story, five-story, multifamily housing, two-story tall. Uh, the biggest takeaway from this slide is that the proposed U32 trail is on the northernmost end of the site. And what we tried to show was that being that high up on the hill, we have opportunities to push the housing down, push the buildings and structures down into the ground so you still get views to the south and to the west when you're up along that elevation. Thank um, These again are available online and um, welcome to have some questions for, for Mike if you have any um, after this, but they are available online as you kind of absorb this. And if you have further questions and want to put information into the survey, that would be much appreciated if you have time to sit with it afterwards. The survey will be still open for a few more weeks. So we understand this is a lot of information all at once. So um, our last slide before we get into questions is a very, very high level cost, cost scenario costing magnitude exercise, which essentially at this stage, we cannot put any numbers to any of these scenarios because they are very high level nebulous in terms of the um, scale of the recreation, the scale of exactly what kind of housing units those would be. But as we think about the city's investment, so as a taxpayer, you may be thinking, what is the, the impact on the city? What's the impact that the city would have to be um, contemplating when thinking about the three scenarios? So we tried to do a little bit order of magnitude here. The next stage of this process with the concept planning, we'll dial these in a little bit more to make it more um, granular and a little bit easier to understand. But essentially, with the three scenarios, there's going to be infrastructure costs for the city. And those include roads, if there's any buildings, like in the recreation scenario, B and C, if there are fields, if there's parking, especially public parking. Um, this does not actually address utilities. That, that question came up at our last public meeting and I was um, unclear if that was included or not. It is not, those, this does not include utilities. Again, we're thinking high level right now, but we are thinking about um, the, the overall cost. Well, if you look at test scenario A, you've got the most roads, so that's gonna have a hot, um, some cost, but no building. And building is where a lot of your costs are gonna be, no city building. So that would have the lowest infrastructure cost for the city. Test scenario B, having a big community center that's, um, we contemplated about 60,000 square feet and, and fields and then public parking associated, that would have about kind of the middle of the three cost. The third scenario would have the roads and the infrastructure plus the buildings, so it would cons be considered the highest infrastructure cost for the city. Then we think about what revenue we can control or predict as the city, so limiting that just to taxable revenue. What kind of taxable revenue would we see coming back on the site? And with test scenario A, if you're doing maximum housing, there's not a scenario in my mind as a consultant that would recommend the city be the developer of the housing themselves. So it would be subdivided off or sub um, land leased off to a private entity and that private entity would then become taxable. So in this, in test scenario A is gonna be your highest return for taxable revenue. Test scenario B is Max recreation, assuming none is privately owned, now it's completely still taxable, uh, non-taxable 
for the city ownership, that's going to be your, uh, your lowest, your none scenario in terms of taxable revenue. And in scenario C, if you're subdividing some, you're going to get some return. So what that does is it me it goes, it switches things a little, and it means that the lowest city cost at this little, very high level for these three scenarios, the, the lowest cost would be test scenario A, maximum housing. The highest would be test scenario B, maximum recreation. What this does not include, it is not exhaustive, this is just to give kind of a little bit of education about how to think about this, is it does not include possible grants we could get if we were to pursue more recreation on this site. It does not include um, any operating revenue that like recreation, for example, or a community center could bring in, which could also offset the overall cost to the city. So these are not factored in because it's very unknown at this level given the scale of the recreation and the spectrum of what could happen within those areas. So for now, we're gonna park that there. We can answer some questions if those come up, um, but that again is a little bit of education. So we're gonna actually go to questions, I think next. Yeah, so we're gonna open it up for questions and then we're gonna break out and do this exercise and we're gonna come back together and that'll be the opportunity to share reflections, takeaways, things you really want the city planning team to know uh, between now and our concept planning. So we'd really ask if you can limit what you ask now to questions that will help clarify what we've just presented for the purposes of getting into the exercise. And then afterwards we'll get into more remarks, but uh, we can start. And if anyone from the audience wants to speak, you do have to come to the mic so everybody on Zoom can hear. And if you're in the um, audience online, we ask that you raise your hand. So what'd you say? Sorry. Oh, we can do a wireless mic too. Oh, well, maybe we could just do that. So people don't feel like they have to come up here because this is awkward. Um, do you want to take questions? Okay, let's start with a couple of in-person questions and then we'll go to some online questions. We'll try to go back and forth so we're fair to everybody. Um, I saw Dan's hand up first. So I'm gonna go Dan and then John and then- Can you get rid of the slide? Check, and then check, Oh check, yes, absolutely, check, good idea. Check. Um, okay, so- Check, 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 check. check. I think it disappeared. He might have it. Dan, why don't you just come up and speak at the mic? Yes. Oh, thank God you said something. Yes. So please identify who you are and if you live in or where you live, and that would be helpful. Thank you, Steph. Dan Vosian, Elm Street, Montpelier. Uh, wondering a couple things on their cost projections on infrastructure. Is that infrastructure install, installed on the is that infrastructure installed on the parcel or is that all in for that build out? Meaning are, are there upgrades to the city infrastructure beyond the parcel that need to occur for these build outs to happen? And has that have been considered? Are there upgrades to city infrastructure beyond the parcel that need to be considered for the build out? Okay. I kind of heard, heard two parts to that. Questions. Stand over there. <laughs> um, I've worked with Dan for a really long time, so um, I can boss him around. Like I won't do that to everyone who comes up here. Um, so, so he asked a question about infrastructure. Um, there's two pieces that I want to clarify. One is the when we talk about roads, for example, we're not talking about in the maximum housing or the balanced housing, we're not talking about internal roads to the individual parcels. We would assume those parcels could get subdivided and then the developer would do their own infrastructure. We'd really be bringing utility, um, yeah, utilities and the roads to their property the way that we do in the city everywhere. Um, so that doesn't include individual, you know, um, cutoffs to individual properties or houses. But then he also asked the question about, does that include upgrades to other infrastructure? And no, basically that's, that's exclusive to just this parcel for now. But it brings up the point that if we're talking about this costing at the next stage, 
there's going to be implications if there's sewer upgrades or water needs to be run down, um, you know, either Bar Barry Street somehow or to Route 2, those types of improvements, just like the traffic improvements would need to be considered if we trip over a certain threshold of units, there would be need to be infrastructure um, and uh, traffic transportation upgrades at that intersection. You had another question? A second question is related to the housing needs in the community and whether or not there has been a housing study performed to indicate what types of housing are necessary or needed. Uh, the question was about, uh, is there a housing study that has been done in the community? The last housing assessment uh, for Montpelier was done in 2011. Um, and so, but we know that we, we do need housing of all sorts in this community, um, rental, ownership, um, starter homes, um, it is a need. Um, senior housing, we have uh, uh, an aging community right now, uh, and there is a lot of elderly people who would like to sell their house uh, because they no longer need a house with three, four, or five bedrooms, um, but there's not enough inventory at the one to two bedroom uh, category. So that's, that's a real desperate need. Um, also, the one and two bedroom studios are also preferred by young adults and young families just starting out. So there is a, we know that we need a lot of everything um, and we will get some better census data in May when the 2020 decennial numbers come out. So we'll have some really good information to go off from instead of the ACS estimates, which if anybody who's worked with that knows that it can be really not accurate. Um, so, you know, I think that's something that we're continuing to monitor. Also, we know just from talking with people around central Vermont, Montpelier is a desired community to live in. You could virtually build anything and people will come because we are the capital. We are centrally located on the interstate. And so because of our school systems, also, it's a highly desired community to, to move to. Um, so we're working on getting some more concrete numbers, but um, until, we, until we get some of the more census data, we won't be able to dive a little deeper. Oh yeah. Um, also, if uh, Vermont Housing Finance Agency just came out with a, a report last week saying that we need 30 to 40,000 units of housing in the state of Vermont to meet our demand by 2030. So if you just look at a per capita basis, what that means is Montpelier needs to create 400 units of housing by 2030 to meet our share of the demand in that state, state of Vermont. So um, because we are a desired community, you could even push it further. We could uh, create 600 units and there wouldn't, be, uh, uh, there wouldn't be a problem with finding people to move into them. standing there and then it was Alec and then we're going to go to the online community for a minute and come back. Thank you. John Snell, I live on First Avenue. Uh, I like the fact that there's an assessment of the viewscapes. When I was up there looking at the beautiful views, it's also noisy up there from the traffic and I wonder if there's any evaluation of that. No, not yet. <laughs> It's a really good point, though, and absolutely something, um, you know, one of the things we're aware of is that this is an iterative process, so we're learning so much more once we're out on the site, once we're out on the site in the wintertime, once we're out on the site, and we're not, the city team is not on the site as much as a lot of the residents are. We had one resident on Saturday saying he walks the site like every day, so those kinds of that kind of input's really invaluable. And maybe one of the recommendations that comes out of this phase to do more follow-up study, for example, to do more follow-up study on transportation impacts now that we would have a better sense of scale and so forth. So that might be something that we'd want to put in that bucket. So you can come on up. Yeah. Yeah. Come on up. And then we'll go to Alec and then we'll go online. Okay. Okay. I, uh, my name is Darian uh, McElwain. And I went to the thing on Saturday, which was really great. And I guess that what my question is, is I've been thinking about the, the intersection as you come out. 
And I remember, you know, I've lived in this area for 30 years and I remember where the roundabout is. There used to be a light there. Does everybody remember that? And that was a quagmire. I mean, sometimes I would be backed up for 10, 15 minutes. And now the traffic there is building up quite a bit, like right across from Casella's, um, you know, and sometimes you there's long lines, especially from the Barry Montpelier Road waiting on that roundabout. So I feel like, um, you know, the expenses, you know, I don't see that in the when you're talking about the expenses of high, you know, and you can tax it with all these these things. I don't think that the expense of putting in yet another um, light, which didn't work, you know, in front of the roundabout, which is already kind of overused, has really been taken into account. Um, and then I just want to emphasize what uh, this this man said, um, that yes, we know that we need housing, um, but it's not really quantified. And then my third thing I want to say, and I can't remember who said this, maybe it was you, you were talking about that Montpelier is a very, very desirable place to live. And it's a desirable place because we have Hubbard Park, which everybody goes into and they really love it. And the river uh, corridor is now being developed and the bike path is being developed. Um, so I just, you know, I kind of want to continue that into the future. Um, I would say Hubbard Park's almost overused. And I really want to, you know, put in a plug for recreation. I know we used to have first, first and fitness years ago, like right downtown. And now that's that's no longer there. We have to drive up to Berlin. Um, so it would be nice to have another reser re recreation thing here. Thank you. Gotcha. Thanks. That was a good segue. Shout out to Hubbard Park. Um, Alec Ellsworth, the parks director for the city. Um, I have just a very small question, which is on the natural resources inventory. There are some streams that are sent underground at the top of the property and then daylight again um, mm -hmm. below. On the natural resources inventory, they're, so they're just sh shown as sort of like ending as streams and then reappearing. Is that, um, you, sorry? Yeah, I'm wondering if the streams that are sent into culverts would sort of reappear as streams if we were to develop them for housing and roads and things or how those are represented. Dave, this yeah. one's for you. All right. All right. Thanks. Yeah, we, um, uh, you know, I, uh, depending on the scenario that's chosen, so like the maximum housing scenarios, we utilize the, um, the kind of cart path that's out there now for the country club, uh, because there are, as you, as you know, there's some existing culverts where the streams go kind of subsurface. And so we utilize those existing culverts or stream crossings for those access roads on the residential parcels. Um, that's primarily to kind of um, streamline the permitting and cost uh, estimating as opposed to daylighting those streams all the way through. Um, that, you know, there's certainly other alternatives or options that could be looked at uh, from the housing perspective. Now for the kind of the recreational options, if they're, if we're not looking at putting any roads or infrastructure out that far, for sure, I think the best approach would be to daylight to pull those culverts out and make those full, you know, uh, uh, restore those stream channels through there, um, back to their kind of natural state. Okay. Um, we're going to turn to the online community. I think I see Steve iPad to Steve. That um, might be Steve C. So that would be me. That's you. All right. You're, you up next? you're up and then Paul is after you. Thank you. Uh, Steve C's here. I'm um, I live on North Street. I was at the meeting on Saturday and I have um, one question stemming from that meeting and then a, a related question. Stephanie, you said at that meeting that 70 housing units would trigger um, significant intersection changes at Route 2. We just heard that 300 was the number. So I'm curious about the discrepancy there. My second question, let me just shoot it out there so you can answer them both. What have you heard from the railroad about this project and what are their concerns? Thanks. Dave. <laughs> um, uh, I'm I can take the, the on the first one, um, yeah. the 70 units is a threshold be, uh, at which a traffic impact study would need to be done. Uh, so VTrans, uh, well, there's certain thresholds. And so about 70 units is the threshold at which uh, when this goes, if this moves forward, has to go through Act 250, um, a, a full kind of traffic impact study would need to be done that looks at how many trips are generated, what the impacts are on the adjoining uh, network. 
anything less than those 70, 70 or so units, um, a formal traffic study would likely not need to be done. That was that threshold. And, and then when you get up to the kind of 300 units is when you start to look at a need for a signal. Um, Dave, is it, is it true to say that at 70, there may be some um, mitigation that does need to happen? Uh, you know, with 70 units or more, you, depending on what the traffic study yields, but that there may need to be um, not necessarily a signal, it sounds like, but but other kinds of maybe mitigation. Yeah, um, it's possible, but probably not. The first thing you would likely need to do is put a, a left turn lane in on Route 2. And since we already have those three lanes on Route 2, you've already have that left turn lane essentially there. So um, I don't think anything beyond needing a left turn lane would be needed until you get significantly more uh, units. Okay. Steve, that's a good, that was an astute observation because I might have misunderstood that and Dave wasn't available on Saturday to be my backup as the transportation expert on this. So, um, you know, we know that there will be varying though need for different types of mitigation and the high, you know, the high level is maybe signalization, but there's other types of, you know, different types of um, uh, not mitigation is maybe not the right word, but other kinds of accommodations that we know we need to consider in terms of access, including things like transit, which is part of the bigger picture. Um, sure. Steve, your other question was about the railroad. Yeah, what do you hear from them? Um, we haven't quite engaged with them yet because we don't know what's being planned here. So when I say quite, what I mean is that we flagged it as a thing we know we need to do in the next stage. But when we're talking about these very ex large extremes, one of the things we're very aware of process wise is we cannot predict how this public process will go. Like we can't presume to know that everyone's going to vote one way or another or give us direction on A, B or C, because if if the, there was a big response for something like max recreation, that's going to yield a very different transportation impact that would affect the railroad conversation. So. I will say that it's on our radar as one of the steps we need to take, but we have not yet broached that. Does that answer? Okay. okay. Thanks. Uh, Paul is up next. Yeah, Paul, you're up next. And then Ben, and then Peter, and then we'll come back to the audience here in person. Okay, thanks a lot. Paul Carnahan uh, from Sabin Street. Um, Quick comment, since we seem to be talking about transportation a lot, I'm surprised that the planners are talking about signalization as the highest level of um, traffic mitigation there. Uh, there's been a big effort to put in roundabouts in this city. I think it would be dreadful to put a signal there. I would urge you to look into roundabouts um, and not a signal as the highest level of, of mitigation for traffic, which I think is going to be inevitable. Um, I don't think a left-hand turn lane is going to help the people trying to get out of this development in any way, shape, or form. Um, you guys really have to look at uh, putting in another roundabout there if you're talking about the type of uh, housing that you seem to be talking about. Uh, my question is, uh, there were several mentions, several references to the U32 trail. Um, without explanation of what that is. I know U32 is nearby, but it's not adjacent. Um, it seems to me it might be a little difficult to get to that uh, property from U32. Uh, I'm not sure why there's a high priority on connecting to U32. We've got the uh, Cross Vermont Trail uh, running along the bottom of that property. Uh, and there are right now under construction um, trails going up to U32. I would think a higher priority would be providing uh, cross-country ski trails on that property for the residents of Montpelier. Thanks. I can answer uh, the U32 piece again, Alec Ellsworth, Parks Director. Um, so the U32 trail is a project that started um, before actually the city bought the property. And the vision there was to create a trail that went from U32 all the way to the college, um, the College of Fine Arts. Um, do it in two phases, one to do it um, across the golf course and then come down on the west side of the golf course and join the bike path. And then the second phase would be if and when anything um, happens with Sabin's Pasture to go through there and up to the college. Um, and the idea there is to create, it, what it would create is a, a six mile loop um, 
that would be universally accessible. It would go include the current uh, rec path. It would include part of the Cross Vermont Trail. It would include the Cross Vermont Trail connection up to U32, which is currently being built. And then it would come back across the hillside. Um, so it would link downtown Montpelier with regional high school. It would also go through a number of iconic Vermont landscapes, including the Riverside, Cedar Forest, High Meadows with beautiful views, northern, rich northern hardwood, sugar bush, um, through this golf course with the views of Camel's Hump, and then back to um, town. So just sort of being envisioned as uh, our version of the Stowe Bike Path, a place that would really draw people to Montpelier because it's an adventure that starts and ends downtown, which is one of our key strategic goals for um, trail building. So obviously with the city now owning the property, um, there are uh, changes, you know, there, there, <laughs> we had a certain thing planned out with the previous owner that is there's now a lot more options with the city owning it. Um, and also the process is longer. So um, the U32 trail is sort of sketched in there as something along the Northern border, Paul, to address your question. And um, that's sort of a brief, a brief explanation of what it is. Okay, thanks. And just to clarify, I, I um, thank you, Paul, for clarifying. I, I, I said signal, but I meant to say some kind of control. Um, so VTrans requires uh, for every every time you 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 need to do uh, a signal to also look at a roundabout. So so both of them have to be evaluated in in a certain location. And I think you're right because of the proximity of the other roundabout. This would probably a roundabout would work better just from an overall traffic flow perspective. So I, I misstate when I when I said signal, I really meant signal or roundabout in this location. So thank you for that uh, pointing that, okay, pointing that out. Yeah, and I thanks. think a point about access that we Dave might have mentioned briefly, but I want to really reiterate is that we understand that the importance of access and connectivity between sites. So on a couple of the test sketches, you'll see connections to um, abutting properties. Now, we don't have agreements with those property owners. We haven't had full conversations. We have been speaking with the owners of the Savings Pasture, but those are by no means final locations. It's just showing that you would want these connections for best practices in design to connect abutting sites together um, to create integrated neighborhoods and connectivity to the other parts of town. So, and that would also then have impact to the intersection, you know, have, a, it would help alleviate some of the issues with that as well. Um, so we have, uh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yep. Right. Not for the, sorry. Yeah. That's a separate, this is about the roads with when what Alec was talking about, U32 trail, those agreements are in place. Um, but the, the road connections, we're only showing, showing them as conceptual right now, just to show the idea that that would need to be connected. Um, so we have Ben, Peter, and Linda online that have had their hands raised for a while. We're going to get to them, and then we're going to come back for questions in the audience. Again, we're limiting this to questions. We're going to take questions for about another 10 or so minutes, and then we want to break out into our exercise and then come back, and that's the open time for more comments and feedback. So um, Ben, you're up. Hi, everybody. This is Ben Block. I live up on George Street. I'm also the co-chair of the Montpelier Conservation Commission. So I had a two two questions kind of somewhat related. One being, what is the ultimate limitation to the maximum housing? So I'm not too sure who mentioned the actual units that per capita we should try to build in Montpelier, be it 300 or 600. So what is the limitation of building only five-story buildings on the site as opposed to three-story or single-family homes? I understand that that's for different uses, some, some people would prefer one or the other, but if we're considering just housing size, is the limitation traffic or just viewscape or something like that? Because we have tons of views in the state. The secondary component is considering just, uh, Stephanie, what you're just talking about just now about um, trying to build into the other adjacent parcels and what that has on just increased infrastructure, that would be increased infrastructure costs to the city. So I'm curious how you will handle that, especially with the um, habitat that's already there. I see there's a 50 foot buffer on those on those streams, but the practical um, kind of restoration goal for streams is actually a 100 foot buffer. So I'm curious if that's been considered as well. Thanks. Okay, good questions. Um, yeah, I will definitely. Um, I'm trying to think of them. Hold on. <laughs> um, so the first question is, I have a clarification, Ben. Um, when, you, when you say limitation, 
What do you mean by limitation? I guess I'm not sure. Right. So like the maximum housing map yeah. shows a variety of different housing types, some being three-story versus five-story versus single family lots. I understand the differentiation between like apartments and houses, but why would you not just build five-story houses or five-story apartment buildings I see. throughout okay. the area? If you want to, ma- if you're purely considering maximizing housing. That's true. That's true. Maximum might be a misleading term. So his question was, um, yeah, if you're really showing maximum housing, why wouldn't you show all of it as five-story multifamily? And that's a fair question because that really isn't then maximum, but it is maximum within moderation and and reflecting back some of what we heard during the feedback in the fall, which was that we we really want lots of different product type and different price points and that this not be a strictly low income space or a strictly single family suburb. Um, So showing a variety. So within that, that was the directive we gave to VHB to do the test sketches. So I should have probably clarified that too. But um, so it couldn't, it could have been, you know, yeah, you probably get like a thousand units. I don't know, but with five story buildings, but within moderation, especially considering the topography of the site, taking into some taking in some of the considerations of the natural resources and the buildable conditions. Um, So that's the answer to the first question. The answer to the second question is taking into account adjacent infrastructure. Absolutely. That's going to have to be a factor. If we go to, if we are connecting properties, then we have to look at the capacity of those streets that we're connecting to. Um, So that would be a consideration in the next phase with the costing exercise to try to get some order of magnitude to understand those impacts. Same with if we had to upgrade a, you know, a water line or a, um, a pump station or anything like that. So offsite infrastructure costs have not been factored into that chart I said earlier. Thanks for the question, Peter. Let's go to you next and then to Linda. Uh, Peter Kelman, uh, Mountain View Street. Um, uh, I, I've got two clarifying questions and they're slightly rhetorical. <laughs> um, I, every time I've heard anything either this year or, or, uh, or last summer, People, when people talk about transportation, they seem you seem to be assuming a fixed route bus service. I I I, I hope you will be talking to Green Mountain Transit uh, about my ride, which is an Uber-like um, service, which would uh, uh, which would change the whole question of accessibility. Um, so that's a, sort of a question and a statement. Uh-huh. Um, and this, the other is that um, I was at the session uh, uh, last week, and I, Michael Sherman made a very interesting point, and I think you, you probably should clarify it before that point has to be made again. Um, and the question is, why are you clustering all the five-story buildings or the, 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 the lower-income housing in one place, the moderate-income housing in another place, and the single-family uh, homes in another place? Is there, is that necessitated by the uh, terrain uh, or, or what? Because uh, it would seem that uh, the, the, the sense that we've all had when we've talked about this is a real mixed income, not, not to create uh, ghettos. So I, I'm curious about the reason for drawing it in that way and hope you'll say that you don't mean that in any sense. To, to, to have to happen. Thank you. I can clarify um, one piece of that, which is one design choice that was made just in this concept uh, test sketch phase is the consideration of how much traffic you're sending all the way through the site. So multifamily, having the highest density, having the most cars, having the most uh, people, trying to keep that closer to the existing entrance to where the existing uh, parking and pavement is not sending them all the way through to the back of the site. That tends to be how the density was laid out for maximum uh, maximum housing, for example. Um, Some of the land use practices and and layouts um, were followed here by showing product type that is similar when builders do do developments, they tend to do similar building styles together, um, both from aesthetic perspective, from an economies of scale perspective. It's not to say that it's out of the question to blend the two in some way that's a little more cohesive. So that's absolutely on the table. I think we could say it's on the table for this next phase. This was, again, a 
a starting point, a placeholder to get feedback. So your feedback is noted, Peter. And Dave, I don't know if you wanted to hop in with anything as the for the land planning part of it. No, I, I think you did a good job. I think this is really valuable input. And I think um, it would be good to hear when we get to the kind of more um, comment driven comments, uh, if other folks agree that kind of mixing the different housing stock makes more sense or kind of what is shown. But, but again, this was just an attempt to kind of show as much uh, density as possible in these little nodes. Yeah, thank you. And, and two other points on this, which is that ultimately city council will make the decision and will decide um, how to structure any RFP that goes out for a developer to do any particular housing development. And part of that will have, could have specifications about what they want to see. So if it's some percentage or some range of percentage of affordable units, for example, um, it may be if there's lots of nodes, for example, the ABCD buildable areas, you know, if it's, we want it in A and C, I don't know, I'm just making that up, but if we wanna see it in A and C saying, we want someone to come and propose for both areas, not just take one and then the other, or maybe it's asking that we get a whole bunch of different types of proposals. Maybe someone only wants to develop A and doesn't wanna develop C. So it will be somewhat market driven. So this, if one of the, if the ultimate um, end of this phase, the actionable master plan is for something that is not entirely city owned, in other words, having a housing component on it, it will be a public private partnership. And part of that is then giving over um, some of the control to the market demand and what is financially feasible. And then seeing how the city can be a partner to help make what we want a little bit more financially feasible. So for example, having a TIF district, if we were to extend a tax increment financing district out this far, could we build all of the infrastructure at, a, at no cost to the taxpayer using ta tax increment financing and then it thereby reduce the cost to the developer so that they have the flexibility, financial flexibility to build what we want. So there's a lot of that kind of trade-off that, that happens during that RFP process, which would be the next phase. So that's really more by way of education. Um, so thank you for your online comments. We're going to come in person here. And again, these are questions and we're going to wrap this up in about five minutes. So I think I can take about five more questions and then we'll have more time at the end. So I see your hand with the rose colored shirt and then here in the front and then with the black baseball cap, we'll do you three and then you in the front here and right with the red mask. And then we'll come back. at the You end. said you're going to take my question. Oh, Linda. Oh, sorry. I did totally say Linda. I'm so sorry, Linda. I, I'm so sorry. Thanks. Yes. It's your turn. Sorry. I'm just sorry. I have a question about the impact of, um, has the cost of, to the schools of an increased population base, has that been considered or how is that going to be considered? Um, yeah, thank you again, Linda. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, we have not yet because we don't know what the housing ultimate housing stock would be here. It could be, you know, no units or 500 units. That conversation has not yet been had. Okay. Thank you. Hi, Phyllis Rubenstein. I live on College Street. I have uh, two basic questions. Um, one is the two site maps that show housing both show potential roads, one going west, one going north. And I know you've said that you haven't spoken to landowners about that, but I'd like to hear a little bit more about the potential roads, where they would come out. And um, I mean, because you spent a lot of time talking about whether it's signals or roundabouts that th there'd, there'd be a potential traffic needs down on um, the access road, but you haven't talked about the impact of these two potential roads through otherwise undeveloped areas. So that's one question. The other has to do with on all three maps, I believe there is a note that wetland and stream buffers may be used for hiking, biking and light recreation. Although on all the maps, you also indicate that in the um, passive recreation areas on the east and the west. On the west that there's a, a, a steep ravine and on the east that there's steep slopes. So um, based on the actual terrain, as well as what Ben mentioned that um, the better practice is to have 100 feet buffers 
um, on either side of um, uh, streams, is there really, is it um, realistic to have bike paths and uh, other significant recreational uses that might require some infrastructure, infrastructure as well? Um, so to speak to the impact of connecting roads, again, we are not at that phase. We don't know exactly where those roads will be. We know we need to take into account what those impacts would be from a natural resources perspective, as well as an infrastructure cost perspective. So that will be forthcoming. Um, relative to the stream, wetland and stream buffer, that note is, is when it says light recreation, it does not mean anything with infrastructure. That would be a buffer. It would not be allowed to do any kind of you know, bike path or um, any kind of actual infrastructure in those areas. So it's just akin to somebody walking down to a stream now in Hubbard Park or you know any, any park area, um, that area is to be used. The note is specific to saying that those areas are not off limits with rope or you know gates that you can't use those areas. That was what that note was intended for. Um, okay, we went there, yes, I know that and you was it you next and then black hat okay sorry this is really hard to do you're next you're next and then black hat we had red mask and my name's black hat i live sorry. in montpelier <laughs> i'm dd brush i live on liberty street um and i have a couple questions one you talked about what funding what is the funding that you said is available and therefore is somewhat time sensitive I don't know what that is, how large it is, where is it coming from? That's one question. And I also want to know, to the point that was made earlier about the housing assessment, um, we also have two other things in the pipeline. One is off of Northfield Street with uh, a possible 115 units of housing. And the other one is off of Isabel Circle with possible 50 units of housing. And I haven't heard any kind of coordinated discussion about those projects as it relates to what might be proposed here. And I think that's very important for us to know. And I think you just answered it about the roads, but somebody told me yesterday that a project like this needs both egress and entrance, which means I think the egress cannot just be the existing road. It needs to go somewhere else and the somewhere else is Sabin's pasture and we all know the history with Sabin's pasture and how difficult that's been so I believe that we need some more information about that okay um, I'm going to take these in order um, so time sensitive funding I was speaking to many different sources that federally right now, we have a lot of ARPA dollars coming down. Um, a lot of that is for specific types of infrastructure. Um, some of that's still being allocated, we don't know yet, um, but there could be um, various sources of grants that are coming out that could handle any kind of water upgrades we need here and so forth. So I didn't have a specific instrument in mind, but we know right now because we're coming out of um, pandemic, so-called and coming out of, and um, that's created a lot of different funding streams that may not be available, we don't know, in the next few years. Um, from a housing perspective, the, co the coordination with other housing projects in town speaks to a good point, which is that um, this site is not is not supposed to be the the one size fits all solution to every problem in the city. That's absolutely clear. And there are other efforts that are going to be continuing to happen in other parts of the city between now and when this project breaks ground or sees actual development um, and creation of housing units. So I don't know much about those other projects that Josh could speak to, but um, in terms of the whole net housing gap closing, that's important to think about, absolutely, in terms of how many other units and other projects are being done. Do you want to speak about that before I talk about egress? Uh, in terms of other housing projects, the city planning department is well aware of them. Um, I talk to the developers and actually out of all of the projects out there, we only have one permit application, that's for Isabel Circle, right? So that's the only thing technically that has been a applied for permit for development of 60 something units. We're not guaranteed that this is gonna go forward for 
a permit, you know, we don't know how much, how many units this might be, uh, but we're all in conversation with each other um, and trying to help one another move to the next step. Um, so certainly like we could all be coming into a pipeline of funding at the same time. And we just create some sort of priority, what makes the most sense for the community to invest in first. Um, but those conversations are, are ongoing and they're happening. Um, and to your other point, point uh, access and egress and ingress, absolutely. If you, especially if you trip over a certain number of users or, or threshold of um, units, you would need to, there's planning, um, there's zoning regulations around that as well. So we would have to consider that. And where is that going to go is a, is a big question. And it kind of depends again on the land play, uh, land layout and how that might play out during this stage. So we do have to take that into consideration. Um, okay, you're standing up. If the next person wants to queue, that might be easiest too. Hi everyone, my name is Greg Fox. I live on Allen Row off of Phelps Street. Um, I'm gonna first address my black hat. It is a Central Vermont Little League hat. I'm a member of the, the, uh, the board of directors of the Central Vermont Little League. It's a growing league. We have about 400 kids um, and we're experiencing a lot of success. So as this project moves forward, I would like the, the town and the community to consider um, increasing the amount of indoor recreation space for children um, to, you know, practice sports like baseball uh, during, you know, the short, the, the winter season, uh, because that, as of now, there's really no place for, for the kids to, to practice baseball and other sports during the winter. My question, it really dovetails with what was spoken before, which is really uh, whether there's communication with the, with the VCFA um, because I understand that there's proposals to convert a lot of those buildings into uh, higher density housing and whether that, um, as that project potentially moves forward and this project potentially moves forward, um, whether there's pivot points as to uh, the high density ha housing element of each project. Thank you. Uh, in terms of the VCFA project, right, we're well aware of it. We're in communication with them. They're going through a process right now where they're trying to get their their master their campus master plan their PUD approved by the DRB, right? Um, and so um, I think their next meeting is next week. Um, I anticipate an additional meeting for the DRB to review and decide on approving the PUD. Um, so there are there could be uses of residential uh, development on that parcel repurposing of some of the structures that's not being proposed yet um, what they're just trying to do right now is just get some uses permitted as opposed to conditional use because um, in the the process of development conditional use is really hard sometimes for a developer to get a project going because you can have so so many abutters fighting it um, and you have to have certain thresholds so there's no housing development being proposed there, but it could be one of the uses permitted. Chris Hammer, 11 Core Street. Um, just a couple of questions. Um, in terms of this whole egress issue, is there, what's the threshold for the number of units that would really require an additional road access? I'm sure the fire department or emergency service needs to be a get in and out of there. So that might be not something to consider in terms of Maybe we don't want to build out as much because it's going to trigger a whole nother road. Um, and the other the other thing I was thinking about, I mean, I've been talking with Josh a little bit about this. There's an existing ski trail right now that everybody really enjoys that's groomed now regularly by Unriver Nordic. We've got a coverage of that, and I just sent it to you this afternoon. I think it would really be nice. Obviously, there's going to be a lot of change to the site. It's probably not going to be much golfing going on in there anymore. But I think it would be very easy to build into whatever development happens, some kind of a loop that could be groomed like it is now. Um, and that, that's probably not something we need to worry about at this point. But I think as we get further along, it'd be really great to have that coverage and to see, okay, maybe a lot of that could stay because it's in areas that we're not gonna be, they're not buildable, um, but how could it be incorporated so it could be used by the residents that are gonna live there and as well as city residents. Gotcha. To your um, to your first point, to your second point noted, and to your first point, um, Dave, 
Oh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, the question was, um, is there a threshold for which egress, a secondary egress would be necessary? And to keep in mind that then emergency services would need to be make sure they can be accommodated. And that may be a consideration for the build out. Um, Dave, do you have a answer for the egress question? You're muted. You're muted. Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, my my recollection of the zoning ordinance is that there's not a specific threshold, but that um, there is a desire to have two points of access. Um, one of the things that we thought about as we were considering kind of a layout of this of this property is that uh, the potential for a secondary point of access as just a gated kind of uh, gravel access road just for emergency vehicles. So not to overbuild, uh, you know, the, the street network and, you know, spend money that's not necessary. So to have a secondary access to um, Old Country Club Road that's really just gated with a, a lockbox for emergency vehicles uh, to, to meet that requirement, but without building a full kind of, you know, loop road uh, for all vehicles. So basically it could be, yeah, there's lots of different options at different points, depending on what the, uh, the ultimate, um, ultimate impact uh, scale is um we're going to take your question next and then we're going to hold qu the rest of the questions because we're going to move into the exercise we have another question online i know you have a few more questions here um in the exercise you're going to have a chance to talk to josh and mike here in the audience and i will be online with dave um, to answer questions during the exercise as well and then we're going to come back with whatever time we have remaining for um, additional last comments so please hello um, Devorah Jonas, I live on um, Luma Street. And I noticed that on the papers that the smallest unit you have is 1,200 square feet. And my guess is that there may be single person households. They don't need 1,200 square feet. 600 square feet is generous for a single person and even for two people. So one could also get a lot more units without more structure. Okay, good point. Um, okay, so we're gonna open it up for, um, so we're going to, um, oh, I need to share my screen. Yeah. Sorry about that. Okay, so the question we have, and it's kind of the overall arching question of this stage, and it gets more granular if you take our survey and can give more input. But the overall question is: now that we've had more, we've had the data come in about the um, site analysis and the actual qualities of the site itself, and hearing from everybody and reading through the community feedback. How would you desire to lay out the site? What's the most desired uses you see, again, at the big scale for each of those buildable areas? So we're gonna do an exercise in person. The, the, I'm gonna run through it a little bit high level here. And then Josh is gonna take everybody to the back of the room for the in-person exercise. And I can um, walk you through the poll online. Okay, so in person, there's a chart in the back. There are the test sketches and the buildable areas. You can visit the maps, review the maps, review the buildable areas. There's a chart that shows eight columns. And for each of the columns, each column represents one of the buildable areas. And that's buildable areas and also the natural areas. And then there's a list of uses. And I'm actually just, that's what the chart looks like. It's also in the back. There's a list of uses and you're gonna be given eight stickers. You're gonna put a sticker, a dot in each of the eight columns. Each of you puts one in every column. Make sure you hit every column, but choose from your list of uses. What would you most like to see in that particular area? So you've got eight dots. You can go through each of the areas. What do you wanna see there? And there are some sex, there are some spaces to write in if we've missed a use that um, stands out to you as being missing. And it's gonna help us kind of, again, see what the consensus is for some of these areas. There may be some that are really obvious and there may be some that are less obvious. Yes. Yes, yes. Josh is going to run you through this again when you're back there. You, he can answer any questions about how how to do the dot exercise or any other questions or 
or, or what the uses are. Yep. And so then I'm going to run through with the, um, the online community, we are going to do a poll and we will be um, having a similar activity up there. And then we'll come back together in about, Josh, what do we say? 25, okay. 25 minutes? Yeah, we did. Yeah, I think we have to. Yeah, so 25 is at 10 of, we'll be getting back together for the last 10 minutes of comments. Okay, sounds good. Okay. Will this pick me up? Um, can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Okay. So, um, online community, you can hear me. Is that right? Okay. Um, I can't see you. Let me see how I can see you. Here we go. There you are. Okay. There's everybody. All right. So, with the folks online, we have put the link in the chat to go to the buildable areas map, as well as the other test sketches. For the next five minutes, up until a little after 7.30, we're gonna take questions. I'm gonna start with Phil, his question hasn't been answered yet. Um, and we're gonna answer questions um, and you can look at the maps and you can look at the test sketches and we'll talk about it. And then in a little bit, we're gonna go, you're gonna have a chance with a poll to vote on you type in what use you want to see for each buildable area. Um, I'm going to share my screen here so you can see the buildable areas right on the map, right on the screen now. But um, does anybody have a question? We'll start with Phil and then we'll go to the next person that has a question. If you just raise your hand using the Zoom feature, that would be very helpful. Thank you. I just uh, actually following up on the egress question. Yeah. I remember a number of years ago, there was a proposal to develop Isabel Circle area with over 200 units, and they were required to bring a road down to 302 on the other side. I, I think that was a fire department rule or concern that they didn't want more than a certain number of units at the end of a, a dead end road. Um, mm. so it sounds like maybe the zoning is not specific, but I wonder if the fire department yeah. has any rule on that. Um, and just a comment on the, the idea of an, a gravel road to Old Country Club Road, that would be, um, there, there's pretty steep in there and you'd also need to plow it all winter to, if you really were gonna keep that open. Gotcha, okay, good. But I'm wondering good. if Thank the fire you. department's been consulted on this yet. Not yet, but I believe um, when he was speaking earlier, Chris, right? I think he's involved in emergency services too. So Josh has been talking with him informally, but we know they absolutely need to be consulted as we start planning and showing more of the transportation routes. Yeah. So Thanks, in, so. I yeah. do have a little piece of information on this, which is that the absolute requirement is over some threshold of units. It might be a dozen or maybe even less. You have to provide side by side passing access. So emergency vehicles like ambulances can leave while fire trucks are arriving. Um, that's the only thing that I've ever seen in regulations. Gotcha. OK, great. Um, do we have any other questions if you want to raise your hand in Zoom um, to answer about the process or specifically that you heard tonight? Happy to answer them. Uh, Nat and then David. Nat, you're up. Oh, hi. There you go. Uh, yep. My name's Nat Winthrop. Uh, uh, I'm a 40 year resident of Montpelier with kids and grandkids also living in town. Um, I have sort of a macro question for the whole group before we get into more detail. Um, my impression is that there's a very broad consensus among everybody who has weighed in that uh, we want some kind of multi-use hybrid model, not all housing and not all recreation. Is there anybody of the 50 participants listening who would advocate for either all housing or all recreation, which is very broadly defined? 
I'm not sure we have the ability to kind of poll this entire group in this exercise. I'm just asking if but... one or two people uh, want to speak up. I, I doubt that there's anybody who would not favor some sort of mixed use model, but I'm trying to test that assumption. I, I'm curious as well. I think the survey will bore out a lot of that too. Um, it'll be interesting right. to see. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Nat. Uh, we're going to go to David and I put this in the chat, but David, Shana, and then Diane, and then um, we're going to need to start the exercise part of this poll, but we can continue to kind of answer some questions as we go. We just don't want to lose track of time. So uh, David. Yeah, oh, when you were talking about the cost earlier, I, I think I heard you say that you included roads, but not utilities. Is there any reason for that? I mean, would that affect the cost? Oh, yeah. Like, well, I know it would, but I mean, does it change the, you know, not okay, in terms of the, the max scale. housing is the lowest, right? Right. You know, I, you know running doesn't. a sewer and water line across the property, I don't know what it would cost, but it costs something. Right. And I think our determination was that it's um, it, it doesn't affect uh, the comparison between okay. the three for this scale. And that's Perfect. why, yeah. Um, Shana, did you wanna um, go next? Sure, um, since you specifically asked for process questions too, I thought this could be appropriate. Um, I participated in some of the, you know, phase one, I think it was phase one or maybe it was phase two um, conversations about doing the outreach. And I hear that you did outreach to the, um, to high school students. And I'm wondering if there's other you know, students specifically that you are other um, groups, you know, identity based groups specifically that you did do outreach to, um, you know, including people experiencing homelessness, experiencing people experiencing substance use, people with transportation issues, um, uh, you know, undocumented folks or refugees, um, and you know, just other key communities that should be centered and I think as part of this experience and just wanted to know if there had been specific outreach or focus groups done with with um, those specific communities. Yep. Um, so the student and the business communities were surveyed in part because we had some um, some volunteers that stepped up and we've been looking for volunteers to step up at a variety of different levels to help us connect with all these different stakeholder groups. So we've reached out to a number of different um, groups, organizations, um, civic organizations and city councilors to help us connect. So we're still very wide open to having folks help us um, connect with those communities. But we had a student help stand up, uh, uh, stand up and help actually do the survey for us, which was amazing, as well as Montpelier Alive. Um, we are also reaching out to Meals on Wheels. All um, Meals on Wheels deliveries will get not only the flyer about what's going on, but also a print survey for them to fill in and send back with postage paid for just to make sure we're accessing folks who might not have um, internet stability. Um, so that is an ongoing process, Shana. Happy to talk more about that too, because we're looking for more volunteers to help us get access and, and there's been a few others that I won't even name right now, but you, you and I can definitely talk more about it too. Thanks for sharing those other examples. And yeah, I would love to continue yeah. to stay in Sounds great. Um, and then Diane, and then we're gonna jump into the extra, the poll real quick after this. Um, I have a quick question. Would, are there any natural resources, limitations, or any other reason that um, the buildable areas on the left most side of the map, so E and F, that would prevent you know, um, more multifamily housing, like townhouse style housing, are there actual site limitations that would prevent that or some other limitation that we should be aware of? David. Yeah. No, no, the, um, you know, the thought was, as we were laying this out, that the, you know, the single family homes just fit best back there, but there's no reason, you know, from a, from a permitting perspective or a layout perspective, why those couldn't also be multifamily homes. Yeah, so go ahead and stick your, when you, when you do your poll, that's a good piece to put into that poll. So yeah. um, I do want to get to the poll because I don't want to run out of time. We have just about 15 minutes. You know, I can I can take Steve and um, it says Kimberly Kidney as the, the caption. So I can actually take two more questions and then I can get, and then we can go into the poll since, since we have a little bit of flex here. So Steve, do you want to ask your question? And you're muted. Hello, Steve Cease again, North Street. Um, two quick questions. First, uh, I've skied that western uh, portion of the property, and although the uh, plan says the slopes are moderate, to me they look pretty steep. I'm wondering if you have a detailed GIS 
uh, contour map of, of that area and of the whole property actually color coded so we can see what the actual slopes look like. That kind of goes to the question from the preceding uh, questioner. Second, have you looked at technical feasibility of a road to the west across that big ravine or uh, to the north up toward Town Hill, uh, given the slopes? Dave, do you want to take those? Uh, yeah, the, um, you know, the, uh, I'm sorry, can you repeat the, the first question? Yep, the slopes on the far western oh, side of the yeah. property look steep to me. Do you have yeah. a GIS that demonstrates what they are? We uh, we do, and I think to, to your question, we don't have a color coded map. But if you look closely, you can see the contour lines. So we do have you know existing topography. It would be easy to make a color coded map, but we it's not showing here. But you can. It's it is. I you know apologize. It is hard to see, but if you squint enough, you can see kind of gray lines that show the contours. And so where those contours cluster, you know, are the are the steeper slopes. Dude, I'm wearing trifocals and I can't see them that well. <laughs> yeah, they are, they are there, but I, that's a good point, though. I think it would be good, you know, because I think I think the the lay of the land is an important consideration here, and so you know, I think you know that might be good for our next round is to have some better visualizations of the kind of the shape of this of this property. Thanks. Yep. Thank you. And um, and, and and then to your point, um, it would be a very um, my sense is it would be a very costly road, particularly the one to the west. It, you know, yeah. it would involve likely a bridge over that one ravine. Yeah. Um, so it's it's not a cheap endeavor by any means. But you know, um, it's it's hard to you know it's hard to weigh the, the benefits and costs. You know, it'd be nice to have that connectivity if something happens in Sabine's Pasture to have kind of connectivity maybe all the way back into Montpelier. But there's there's a cost and all the natural resource impacts that go along with that. Gotcha. Great. And you're up. You have your yourself unmuted already. Thanks. Kimberly Kidney is the, yeah. Hello? Yes, you're up. Okay, okay. I just want to be clear. This is uh, David Kidney, Kimberly's okay. uh, husband, um, using her computer. Uh, and I wanted to respond to Nat, who happens to be my neighbor, uh, and you couldn't ask for a better one. Um, I, I support rec, rec and housing, but if, and, and I don't think I'm alone on this. Uh, I, I raised my children here. I now have three grandkids in town. My kids walked to the rec center uh, five days a week in the winter. My grandkids are now using it. I really think the rec center itself should be in the downtown. I mean, I think it should be either at the bottom of Saban's Pasture, at the parking lot off of Court Street, where you'd keep parking and build a rec above it, or if we're gonna do fields, rec fields out uh, at the Elks Club, I think that we should build a rec center down by the pool. We wouldn't need those fields anymore. We could get new fields out there. Uh, and we can talk about that more, but I, I think, I, I know a lot of young families because my daughter lives here with her kids who they, they all want the rec center downtown where middle school kids it's amazing how many middle school kids walk to the rec center after after um school so yeah. i that's just with nat's question i do want rec fields out there but i'd much rather see the rec center in town thank you okay all right thank you okay we're going to move into the poll so the way this is set up is going to be eight questions i'm going to load them each individually as we go the first, it's going to go through each. I'm going to start it right now, in fact, so you can see it. But essentially, it's going to show you a list, and you can expand your box on your screen. You can expand the box um, that has the poll in it so that you can see the full list. But the list is there of all the uses that have been suggested so far with a few places for, you know, if you, we've, we've identified there's maybe others that you're wanting to see. And you'll see at the bottom of that list, if you scroll down, a place for you to enter your answer. So this is going to go through, every question we go through is going to be for a different buildable area or natural area. So it's going to start with going through A through F and then buildable uh, natural areas east and west. So this is, the question is looking at the buildable areas map, which we have up on the screen, Buildable area A, what do you most want to see there? And please type in your answer based on this list or another use that you can think of. And that's what you most want to see there. And, you know, understanding that there may be a blend at some point. And then hit submit and we'll move on to the next area. And I'm going to do about a minute and a half starting now for each question.
Stephanie, if you can hear me, I've watched this. I zoomed into the buildable areas map. Now I can't get back to the poll. Help. Oh. <laughs> if if you hit the um if you hit your poll, um if you hit your zoom icon, does it bring you back to the uh -huh. to the poll? Uh no. Well, I'm out of the poll. There's a three dot menu in the bottom right hand corner usually. <laughs> Uh, hmm. I'm not seeing it. My three dots are on top, Steve. Look up top. Oh, yeah. So where do I? Oh, poll and quizzes. Isn't that interesting? All right. Gotcha. Thanks very much. Where Thank you they? so much for the crowd. The crowd help. <laughs> yeah, really. I'm not a dedicated Zoom expert. Are we still on question one? We are. Now we're going to go to question two. I was waiting for as many respondents as okay. we could we could get. Um, I'm, I'm sorry. Is the, the poll is going to show back up, or uh, uh, it'll I'll pop back up the next question. Yep. Don't you don't okay. have to do a thing as long as you hit submit on your answer. You're good. All right. Okay. Steve's confused me. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to okay. end this one. We're going to move on to, to um, area A. Um, here we go. I'm sorry, area B. So this is. Same question, you can scroll down and same list of uses. So it's just, what do you see for buildable area B? We may not need a minute and a half for every one of these because it may be pretty predictable. All right. Um, it looks like we have the same amount participated. Oh, no, a little bit more. Okay. About 10 more seconds on this one, and we'll go to the next one, the next area. Stephanie, when you say the areas, can you just identify them a little more clearly? Then yep. we can. Them? Good question, Peter. Okay. Um, all right. So we're going to move on to the next area. Peter, you can hear me, yes? Yes. Okay. Um, so this is area C. And if you look at the buildable areas map that's on, that's on my shared screen, it is, I'm sorry, hold on. I have too many screens open. Area C is over here on the east, um, yes, east side of the site. Stephanie, that's not the sledding hill. The sledding hill is off to the right of that. Is that right? Or is that the sledding hill? Uh, I'm not, I'm not positive. Not I'm sorry, David. Wood. I, I think it's part, of, it's part of D, Dave. Not C? No, C's got, C's C got, is all wooded. C is wooded. You couldn't, you couldn't slide there. Okay, thank so you. C is here and D is up here toward the back of the site natural areas over here. Okay, I'm gonna go on to our next question. Um, so we have time here. We're gonna to go to sec, uh, area D. Again, that is back here. So that is the sledding hill. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, 
everyone's getting a lot faster at this. So we may be able to fly through the next four pretty quickly. <laughs> I appreciate everyone being game to do it this way. There's a lot of different ways we could try to replicate a dot exercise in person to do it online. And this is one way. <laughs> I don't know if it's the best way, but it was one way. Here, this is our best attempt. All right, uh, we're going to move on to um, area E. Didn't let me submit. What? Oh, sorry. We're moving on to E, but again, feel free when you um, finish with this. You're welcome to send us an email. You're welcome to also so take the survey. There are similar questions in the survey, but also emailing Josh directly. Any feedback? We're happy to take that. This is section E. Um, again, you asked where that might be. Buildable area E is back here. So again, if this is the existing building, you kind of head back through all those cart paths. We're really getting into the kind of the top of the site. Thank you for that. All right, I'm going to close this in about 10 seconds and we'll move on to area F. All right, moving on to area F. And area F is back here, really corner of the site, almost before you get to the ravine. About 25 more seconds on this area. We'll move on to the natural areas. Why would it, why won't it let me submit? Bottom of the bottom of the thing, and you you filled in some answer on the short yeah. answer. I did it in the in the in the written section. Comment and then hit submit, and we're going to move on to the next question for area F. Area or not area F? Sorry, we just did area mm -hmm. F. We're moving on to natural area east. So that would be over here in this natural area where my mouse is, all the way to the east, wooded area, steep slopes. I'm sorry, can you put your mouse on where that area is? Yeah, absolutely. Yep. It's, it's this natural area over here. Can you see my mouse now? Kind of south of, uh, just south of where the possible location of U32 trail is mentioned all the way to the right of the site says stream and setback zones and steep slopes. So housing is not an option here. There's no housing shown on that in any of the test scenarios. We assume a lot of folks will say trails, outdoor rec, et cetera, but we wanna leave it open to whatever else might be coming to people's minds. And I'm gonna close this in about five seconds and we're gonna move on to natural area west as people are sitting down here in the room. Okay, and now lastly, natural area west, which is to the very far left on the screen where the ravine is. It says natural area, difficult to difficult access across steep ravine, et cetera. 
Again, we will have opportunities if you would like to just email us or submit questions in the survey for these things if you didn't get a chance to write out everything you wanted. On, on the, excuse me, on that area, you yeah. might mention there's quite a mature hemlock forest beyond the ravine that is quite attractive and possibly a deer area, um, yeah. making a road through there even more potentially problematic. Yeah, okay, writing that down, yeah. Yeah, we did see there is a designated deer wintering area up in there. It's quite pretty. Big hemlocks. Leave it alone. My concern. Noted, Steve. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Sounds like Thank we you. have enough um, responses here. Well done. I'm impressed with this group. We did not know how this was going to go. <laughs> Thank you so much for your patience, your cooperation, your participation. That was really helpful. We have the results now. Um, we'll be compiling that with the in-person um, exercise with these dots. For anyone who is here on Saturday, you know the dot exercise, um, and we're consolidating all of that. And that will be, I didn't mention this in the full group, but we will be going back to city council at the end of March. And part of that will be the report out about the feedback. So I'm going to, uh, if you have further questions, Dave will have to take them because I'm going to get up and try to get the rest of the room. I'm going to do some cat wrangling. I'll be back. Dave, I have a question. Yeah, I will. Uh, I'll do my best to answer. Um, to the, uh, the the to the left of the purple uh, existing building area. Yep. Is that area not part of the pro uh, property? Uh, that's right. Yeah. If you if you look closely, the yellow, you can see the property line right. uh, is yeah. there. Yep. Yep. So it's a separate parcel. Do, do we do we know who owns that? But we'd really like to have everybody come back and sit down. Uh, um, Steve, Rib Steve Ribellini owns it. It's a seven hour, seven acre parcel, I believe. Steve Ribellini owned the rest of this too. I'm, it's odd. It seems odd that that wasn't included. Oh, well. <laughs> it was already a separate parcel going in. Uh -huh. I don't know why. Okay. Um, yeah. Online community, you can hear me? Yes. yes. Thank you. Um, okay. Thank you, everybody. That was um, the dots. I'm excited to go see uh, the polls. The poll is done. We It's the same exercise, but done a little bit differently. Um, as I was mentioning to the online folks, we are going to be compiling all of this data uh, the, the dot exercise was done at the Saturday event. We also are doing the poll event at our fully virtual meeting next Thursday. So tell your friends, please. It's a daytime meeting for anyone who can kind of pop out for lunch but couldn't make an evening meeting. And we'll be consolidating these results. We're going to be meeting with city council at the end of March to bring uh, back our findings from this period and to get some guidance from them relative to the next steps in the concept plans. We have five minutes, six minutes left. Um, we did have, you got your question answered with the black mask. Okay. 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 We can take a few more comments. Um, I'll look out for online folks as well. Um, since we're just going to try to capture people who haven't spoken yet. So let's start with the uh, blue hat and flannel and then sweater. I'm sorry. I'm going with visibility here because we're really pressed for time. If you'd come up and if you'd cue at the mic, um, if there's questions, we're going to have to answer them either later, but we can take comments. Yeah, Stephanie, can you, can you use the, lose the slide again, please? My name is Lori Seligman. I want to thank you for going through this process. It is a lot. Really appreciate it. Um, I just want to speak up. I think other people have been doing this. I'm a, um, involved with the ski club. I'm a volunteer assistant coach. It is an incredible resource for our our youth. So we had on Saturday, um, maybe I don't, over a hundred kids there. So we had a youth program, like little, little ones. And then we had middle schoolers um, and high schoolers racing. And it's an incredible resource. It is an extension of everything we do as a community. 
I understand that you haven't gotten to that level of detail, but I wanted to speak up for it because it wasn't mentioned as a use case. So just want to make sure it's there. Thank you. Can identify yourself. Yeah, my name is Jessica Oparaski. I'm a Montpelier resident, and I just want to say that we want skiing, we want rec, we want all those things, but it all comes down to housing. Like we want our community to be youthful so that we can have ski programs, but we shouldn't be eliminating the potential for housing so that we can keep that smaller group of, of people that want to ski. I love to cross country ski. Yeah, no, I'm just thinking about like the, the rest of the conversations, like throughout the, the evening, when we've talked about these things, um, there's a lot of older people in the community. If we don't have housing for everybody with families, we're not going to have people to enjoy for kids to go out to the rec center for kids to go explore these trails like we need the housing so just as a, a thinking about we have to check our privilege sometimes and and be more open to inviting everybody in all kind of areas and then we'll i'm sorry let me just procedurally say we'll have your question and then matt and then we've got three comments online and then we're gonna to have to wrap up for the sake of time. My name is Malcolm Fitzpatrick. Professionally, I've been an engineer and urban environmental planner. So I have some comments. I think this site is extremely difficult to develop. And I thank you for the maps that illustrate how difficult it is to develop. Every dollar put into this to try to make it developable should go into housing on other sites. There are other places in Montpelier. Look at the aerial photos online. Look at the land west of Terrace Street. There's an old subdivision in there of hundreds of acres, undeveloped. Roads are there, at least they're laid out. The development of this has to meet Act 250 because it's prime land. I've not heard how you're gonna meet that problem. The streams, the wetlands are problematic. Every time you, you cover some land under the present state laws, you have impervious surface, roads, houses, you have to infiltrate that land, that water back into the ground. I've not seen any area to show where, how you're going to put that water when it rains into the ground. There are minimal flat areas on this. Recreation is probably the best use. You only have one way out now. That's bad, as people have said. And there's a need to get connect Town Hill Road down to Route 2. However, this area, this lot, big lot, has only one access and excess. And downhill when you get to it, try to get to it, and that is a busy road that you cannot get onto. As someone said, a stoplight, a rotary. That is a traffic person's engineer's nightmare. One rotary after another. And you can't, one, you, one rotary backs up, it is all comes to a standstill because no one knows who has the right of way. Those in the rotary have the right of way, but they can't get out. It's a nightmare. The slopes on this are horrendous. They don't tell you off on the right on the big maps, there's a scale of elevations, but they don't tell you on the, on the site map, the roads and what the elevations are. 5% is probably the steepest you want in the subdivision, 10 for a short distance. I suspect some of these are 15 or 20% slopes. They're going to be nightmares to put in. There's no map showing depth to bedrock. Depth to bedrock, why do you need that? You need to know where your foundation is going to go. What you have to blast out of rock to put a five-story foundation in. Why do that when you can build on other land 
that is buildable. Save your money, Montpelier, and invest in sites that can produce a lot of housing. It's available, it's out there. Goldman owns west of Terror Street. He bought that land, he's holding on to it. For what reason, I don't know, but maybe money will talk, at least eminent domain can be used. Maximum housing, you're not gonna get, you know, if you have only 300 units on this site, that means if you, probably two persons per household with cars, that means 300, 600 out in the morning, double that because you're two person, 1200 going out onto the route two in the morning, some returning immediately after, some going out to take the kid to the nursery school, whatever. That's about a thousand cars going out there in the morning. And come going out and coming back. That exit is not built for that traffic load. We need a traffic study. We should have done it before we bought the land. We need to know what is going on before we dream up uses for this site. I suspect when we get down to it, if you know the costs, external costs, they're going to be worthwhile to invest in, the, in an expensive piece of flat land, good building, good site, no rocks on the ground. Rocks on the ground, you can't just blast for foundation. You've got to put water supply in. You've got to put sewage out. I'm sorry. Is and there no time limit? More than four feet. Yeah. And you got to put good system in. You got to connect it up to the capacity to get to the wastewater treatment plant. Uh, All of that should be cost evaluated before we do anything more decision on this site. Thank you. All right. We have one more comment in the um, audience, Matt, if you oh. have a quick comment. And then we have three online um, Jessa and then, um, sorry, Jessa and then David's iPhone if he's still on. And Cindy. I have my timer, so I'll try to keep brief. Um, hi, I'm Matt Wilson, and I am the communications coordinator for the community services department. Um, the community services department, so that'd be the senior activity center, the recreation department, and parks and trees. I would advocate for a mixed use approach to the country club road, country club road site, um, specifically favoring recreation but also some housing. Um, I'm a relatively new resident to Montpelier. I moved here last year and I recognize immediately how impossible it was to find housing within the city. And I currently live in Barrie now. Um, and I have to commute every day. Um, I would advocate for housing for volunteers and AmeriCorps members, especially. Um, I've heard anecdotally from some of our AmeriCorps service members how difficult it is, especially on their stipend, um, to find housing. Um, let's see here. I think that we should also look at recreation as well, because as I work in the recreation office, I see every day the need for public spaces um, to do various recreation activities. And because it's, an, it's a hundred year old building, um, there is very limited use that we have um, for recreation activities. Um, yeah, and I really believe that more place-based assets in our community can ensure economic growth and drive innovation for different forms of activity at the Country Calder Road site. And also, finally, I would advocate for a space for arts and culture. Thank you. We're going online. Jessa uh, is next. And if you're ready. Yeah. Sure. Thanks so much. Um, thanks for this process this evening. It's been really informative. Um, I want to echo. I want to echo um, some comment, a comment that was made earlier about the location of a recreation center. Um, I have concerns, and I know a number echoed this in the earlier um, 
process this maybe was this fall about locating especially after school activities and things that kids need to get to regularly that far from the community center and so I don't I won't echo all of those comments but I just I want to register some concerns with how the survey um, that's open right now is structured I actually went on earlier today um, I'm glad I waited till this because um, I think a lot of it will be repeated, but there's a whole section of that survey about what amenities individuals might want to see in a recreation center before asking about where it should be located. So I'm strongly in support of a new recreation building. I think we need more recreation spaces for people of all ages and all abilities, um, but I just don't favor it being in that location. And so it's hard to even know how to answer the survey about, you know, whether I would want certain services in a recreation center, because I feel like that's supporting them being at the country club site. Um, as opposed to just in general, or it's not it's not actually clear from the survey, is this specific to the country club site or in general in the community? So um, I just wanted to make sure that the folks um, sort of interpreting the survey results know, like, for example, I may say I don't want certain things, but that's because it's at that location as opposed to having those assets available in the community. So thank you for, again, for listening to all of us and having this tonight. That is the limitation of building surveys. <laughs> it's just, I, you're right. I mean, that would be a question we could ask up front that would then frame some of the other questions. Um, and I think there is a place to fill in some other remarks. And so I would encourage you to, to put that context in there, but it's helpful for us to think about that when we review those. Um, so thank you for pointing that out. Um, Cindy? Hi, I'm Cindy McLeod, and I've lived in Montpelier since 1974. Um, I just have three very quick comments. One is that I am so pleased that all the young people who have been here and expressed their point of view, because this is your future, and I just really want to thank you for stepping up and expressing yourself. Um, I want to just second the other comments people have made. I'm all for recreation. I voted more for trails and outdoor fields at this site, but I would like to see uh, a great new recreation center downtown or in downtown Montpelier. And third, I'm just very impressed with all the presentations you all have made and the work you've done and the way you've structured this. And um, I've been a planner for years, but I, I do want to commend you. I think you've done a great job. So thank you. Um, uh, Phil, you had had your hand up earlier and we didn't get to your question. I didn't know if maybe that was still left over from when we did our session. If you still have a question or comment, you can unmute and we'll get yours because I didn't. I, I do have a couple comments. I'll okay. be brief. Um, okay, thanks. The, you know, there was a discussion about uh, skiing versus housing. I think there's a way to have both. I think we could cluster the housing in a way that there are trails uh, the, the test sketches we've seen so far have an awful lot of roads cutting off potential trails. So I'm wondering if there could be a more creative design uh, to, to make room for, to leave the ski trails, uh, even with the housing. Just wanted to echo someone earlier saying we need room and, and housing for downsizers, people moving out of larger houses. I was involved with a group that uh, proved that was a lot of demand for that. So that I think condos would be particularly appealing to that group, uh, but we need, you know, a mix of, of rentals and owned homes, mixed income. Um, and another important group is, is young families that want to come here. Uh, if you're a teacher in Montpelier, you know, can you afford to live here? Uh, hopefully there can be housing uh, to meet, meet those needs. And the final thing I'd say is, it, it is this is difficult uh, figuring out what we can really do here and afford without knowing some of these costs. Like if, if we have to build another road, uh, how much is that gonna cost? How much does it cost to bring infrastructure, sewer and water up to the site? Um, you know, what is the bedrock situation? So I, I'm hoping before the master plan is finalized, we can get a sense of, of costs and, and what's realistic. Because uh, in Montpelier, we have a lot of other demands with, with our roads and water system and the cost of building a rec center. So uh, just just hope that can be factored in. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Um, we had to, we have to call it. It's past time. And I know not everybody got to say things twice, but we hope we got some, most comments from everybody. Thank you so much for taking the time 
Um, thank you so much. Please complete the survey if you can. There's additional questions that might not have gotten asked here today. And um, there's a meeting on the 9th if you want to participate. Anything else? Um, if you if you want to contribute a comment, you can email uh, me uh, your comments, Jerome at montpelier-vt.org. You can find my information on the website. Happy to respond. Thank you.